Welcome to the Aerospace Advantage podcast. I'm your host, John Slickbaum. Here on the Aerospace Advantage, we speak with leaders in the DoD, industry, and other subject matter experts to explore the intersection of strategy, operational concepts, technology, and policy when it comes to air and space power. So if you like learning about aerospace power, you are in the right place. To our regular listeners, welcome back. And if it's your first time here, thank you so much for joining us. As a reminder, if you like what you're hearing today, do us a favor and follow our show. Please give us a like and leave a comment so that we can keep charting the trajectories that matter to you most. This past week, an Air Force flight crew established a new marker in the history of air power. They didn't break a new barrier. Instead, they said goodbye to an old friend. They boarded JSTAR's tail number 92-9111 or 929111 as known by the flight crews at Robbins Air Force Base. The last JSTARs in the inventory and they headed west to Kelly Air Force Base, where the aircraft was officially retired as a training aid. The rest are at the Boneyard at Davis-Monthan, and one is preserved at a museum display at Warner Robins, Georgia. This marked the sunset of an incredible airframe, which fundamentally redefined what it meant to command and control forces at the front edge of the battle space. And when you think about it, that's the heart of warfare. Understanding how to employ your forces better more effectively than your adversary, to both stay out of undue danger while also seizing opportunities. That quest has defined military operations for centuries. And U.S. commanders have recognized and appreciated what the J-Stars and its crews brought to the fight. That's why the aircraft and associated personnel have been deployed every day for the past 21 years, executing more than 14,259 operational sorties which totals out at over 141,169 flying hours in support of every combatant command around the world. But it's important to highlight that while the JSTARS airframe is sunsetting, the mission is actually scaling. The need to understand the battle space to effectively command and control forces is more important now than ever, especially against peer adversaries in highly contested environments. Add in the scale of a region like the Pacific and the importance of smart force employment grows even more important. That's why the Air Force and the Department of Defense are so focused on realizing concepts like Joint All-Domain Command and Control, or JADC2, and Advanced Battle Management, ABM. This is going to impact how battle management effects are secured from a technological perspective. It's going to reshape the job function of trained command and control professionals, but the actual mission itself, it's here for the long haul. And that's what we're here to talk about today. We're going to explain the battle management mission, both from a historic lens, highlight the roles and missions of the JSTARS crews, but also look at what's next. Joining me for this conversation is Mitchell Institute Executive Director Doug Berkey and Lieutenant Colonel Alex Big Bobby Wallace, who is a longtime JSTARS battle management veteran and is now the Director of Plans at the 461st Air Control Wing at Robbins Air Force Base. And as you well remember, Bobby also served as an Air Force Fellow with the Mitchell Institute a few years ago. Gentlemen, it's always great to have you back with us. Hey, Slick. It's awesome to be here. Thanks. And this is an important topic. Appreciate you making the time. Yeah, he's like glad to be here as well and happy to be talking about C2. And as you know, I'm pretty passionate about it. Yeah, absolutely. And and Doug, I want you to kick us off. I tried to cover it in the opener, but really what is in play right now and why the sunset of the JSTARS and the transition to a really new way of executing the battle management job? Yeah, no, it's it's a good question because this airframe is just so iconic. And you think about combat operations over the last 30 years, and I can't think of a single instance where one of these things hasn't been deployed So it's a huge change. And that really ties to what's going on. And and first off, these airframes are just aging. You know, it's important to remember, they were all commercial 707s for J-Stars that were built in the 1960s. They're used super hard. They got these not just from secondhand users, like we're talking third and fourth hand users. One of them, I believe, even came out of Afghan Airways and was hauling livestock. No joke. They were acquired by the Air Force and modified in the early 90s. And I mean, like I said, they're just flown nonstop 30 years of combat operations. These things are just so critical. 
There's another factor too, and that's that there are new mission requirements driven by peer competitors like China. In the past decades, we've had pretty permissive environments to execute these missions and be over top with the sensor and the and the controllers. And that's no longer really going to be a, a theory of case. It's, it's going to be successful given the threat environment. So they're looking at how do they net similar effects, but better survivability. And then it just comes down to the notion that the mission has to continue. So they're really just looking at how do they stack it differently to evolve. And throughout it all, the battle management expertise is going to be crucial. And that's why it's so important that we have Bobby with us here today, because he represents that. Absolutely. And all right, Bobby, let's get down to the nuts and bolts here. J stars, explain what the aircraft and the crews mean to you. And you've spent your entire adult life in the air battle management community. Yeah, well, hey, so like it's covered in the introduction, I've had the privilege of flying on both the E3 AWACS, that's where I started my career out, and with the J Stars uh, after I graduated from weapons school. And there's several similarities and differences between them. And so they're not only both sensors, which is really what they're most often discussed and associated with, and especially in the case of the J Stars, but also they're a huge battle management operations center that provide, or in the case of J Stars, provided a critical link between the operational and tactical levels of the air war. These functions included a variety of different mission areas, the management of targets, both pre-planned and dynamic across an operational energy or operational area, but also some of the less sexy tasks like the real-time management of airborne fuel in a theater and the net fuel that, that may need to be reallocated or retasked at a, at a moment's notice based on the changing conditions of battle. And so across my time, some of the operations that I helped support in my career included where I uh, managed the aircraft uh, across Af Afghanistan and put them where they needed to be when the troops called, when the guns started going, uh, to homeland defense and disaster support, which I flew in both the E-3 and the E-8. And in that particular mission role, the, they provided critical comm links between rescue agencies and uh, the FAA and other aircraft and uh, that, that were supporting. And then later on in uh, my career with JSTARS reconnaissance operations, where I helped develop theater command and control, as well as battle management plans in the event an operation were to kick off. So both of these platforms provided uh, and provide in the case of AWAC still, although half the fleet just got retired this year, some of these critical links between the operational and tactical level of the war and really informed combatant commanders and gave them something at the battle's edge to uh, affect the battle space. Yeah, well, a great overview, and I appreciate that. And, and Doug, I really want you to take us back in history. So where did the requirement for JSTARS uh, originate? It's like, thanks for that question. And I want to wind back the clock here a little bit. It all comes down to putting combat assets in the right time and place to get the job done most effectively and efficiently, and, and doing so at acceptable risk. The requirement for this really came about specifically for JSTARS and its Bobby-related AWACS during kind of the end stages of the Cold War to help support maneuver of ground forces, specifically for J-Force, for J-STARS in Europe against Soviet threat and AWACS, obviously, it was more the air side of the equation. But really, this notion of using sensors, controllers, and co communication links to yield a real-time command and control function, it, when I look back at history, it goes back to Battle of Britain, where the role of information, it revolutionized operational and tactical warfare. Think about this. In World War I, we didn't have any sensors for the air war. And so you had to throw mass quantities of aircraft up in the sky in hopes of encountering the enemy. And that's kind of what the whole Dawn Patrol thing was about. And it was hugely inefficient because the vast majority of the aircraft, they never saw an enemy. And so it just was very intensive, not a smart way of going about things. And in World War II and in the years in between World War I and World War II, what we call the interwar years, the Royal Air Force, they saw this threat brewing on the continent, and they knew they had to make the most of a very limited fighter force. And so they constructed radar sites on the coast. They created a command and control network. They had trained controllers, which actually helped curate and, and process raw data into actionable information. And then they fed that to fighter command units and told them when to launch, where, and how to pull the intercepts. And it made the most of an incredibly limited force. And it's what won Battle of Britain. And it all came down to being effective, efficient, and highly prudent. And this, it evolved in the Cold War 
because that whole notion of making the most of a very small force was hugely important when we had to defend the entire continental United States against Soviet Union armed with nuclear equipped bombers. And so things like the Dew Line Network, the SAGE system, all of that, it really came to bear in a big way about how do we make the most of Air Defense Command fighters and get them to the right time and place. And that's a really tough job. And it demanded sensors and controllers uh, to, to bring that to bear. As part of that, they created mobile nodes within the network on things like EC-121 constellations, the famous Connie. And that was how do they push the sensor network further off the coast so where you couldn't put fixed radar sites and things like that. And guess what? Vietnam comes along and we needed better situational awareness and direction of our, our forces, the air assets. They deployed those EC-121s and they, they really kind of improvised and created new tactics, techniques, and procedures for how do they guide in air war real time when the enemy was coming up and engaging us and how do we avoid those surprises that really projected vulnerability. It was massively successful. And so they needed to update that those systems. And that's where AWACS came along in the 70s. Again, air focused, J stars ground focused, think it of putting the sensor overhead and being able to observe things like armored columns and things like that. That came about as a concept in the 80s. And it was really at the bleeding edge of technology. And so Bobby's the expert on JSTAR. So I want to hand it over to him to, to finish off that story. But man, it has been a success nonstop. Yeah, Doug. So, you know, you've alluded to basically C2 battle management nodes like the AWACS and the JSTARs are force magnifiers that make us more efficient. And while AWACS is focused on that in the air battle, as was perceived to be a giant problem during the Cold War, well, the ground war in Europe and the threat to Eastern Europe posed by the Soviets' numerically superior army put a, a very similar issue at stake. And this is kind of where JSTARs came about, uh, as you alluded to. Now, it was formally created as JSTARs in the 1980s, but the concept itself actually goes back to uh, the 1950s, and I'll get to that in a minute. But at the end of the day, JSTARs were developed uh, during a time of major underpinning that they would be able to operate from sanctuary bases far enough behind enemy lines where adversaries' weapons couldn't reach, but their sensors could. And so during the 1950s and 60s, where the, basically the battle lines were drawn in the Cold War, uh, the Army and the Air Force both started developing the concept of ground-moving target indication and detection simultaneously and in their stovepipes. And the, one of the earliest programs that was developed here was the Pave Mover program. And it wasn't really until the 1980s, Doug, as you mentioned, that Congress and service senior leaders recognized that we were developing the similar idea, the same idea, actually, in these stovepipes. And so the Congress and the senior leaders canceled each of their individual programs and then created today what we know as is the Joint Surveillance Target Attack Radar System program, or the JSTARS. And that happened in May of 1982. Originally, that idea was conceived to be on a, a, a smaller, more stealthy platform. And I say originally, this was in the 1980s when JSTARS was at its origin and stealth technology was kind of in its infancy. And we wanted to put, put this platform there, but sensor size limitations and the power needed to get the uh, radar data out there really kind of hamstrung what you could put in the air. And so the 707 was settled on as a test bed, but as the Cold War ended, Desert Storm occurred, the platform was highly successful in the Gulf War and Desert Storm, and, and the 707 was actually settled on as a permanent solution due to its relatively low acquisition costs at the time. And as you mentioned in the towards the beginning of the podcast, like so, a lot of the J Stars, in fact, all the J Stars were bought secondhand because at this time the airlines were moving on to <laughs> more advanced technology, and so these spare aircraft were hanging around. Um, but it was really never ever supposed to be the permanent solution. It was supposed to be a bridge to an all-in-one platform like the E-10, which was conceived to be a multi-sensor 747-based platform. That idea was tossed around in the mid-90s and the early 2000s for being canceled outright in the 2010s. And so the aircraft and the crews of the J-STARS ended up answering the call for the ground moving target indicator service, the battle management service, early warning uh, for uh, over 30 years in that vein. Yeah, it's really incredible. And, and add the perspective from both of you, you see the origin and then you know, think about the incredible mission that it did for 30 years. Bobby, if you can take us on a tour of the J-STARS and talk us through a walk around uh, 
of the jet and tell us what's special about the jet and, you know, help us understand what's inside because that's what's important, right? The crew positions and their roles. Yeah, absolutely. So if you were to walk up to a J-Stars on the ramp, you would see a white 707 uh, with your traditional 707 features like the high frequency radio antennas off the vertical stab and the ends of the wingtips. But what would really stand out to you about the J-Stars is underneath the nose of the aircraft is the 24 foot long. We called it the canoe. And it's what basically a sensor pod that held the, the radar aperture. Uh, you'd also see various other UHF, VHF radio antennas, uh, battle link antennas. And let's not forget the J and J-Stars was joint. We actually had Army members on board as well. And we had Army link systems to support the Army schema maneuver with our sensor. And so that's what you'd really see from the outside. Now, once you got in the jet, you walk through the door and you'd have your flight deck in the front, your pilot, your co-pilot. We also flew with a flight engineer. And then working your way backwards, you'd see some comm and computer technicians. So our comm technicians and our data racks, were, we had a little crew rest area in the front where we could uh, fix a meal or on really long sorties, grab a nap. And then right behind that, you would see your comm and computer techs. And they were really charged with the airborne operation of the radars and the radio. So if a radio broke in air, we had folks on board that could go and fix it and keep that critical link working. And then further back, you'd see the navigator. So in the case of the J-STARS, this is different than the AWACS. The navigator actually sat in the back of the aircraft amongst the mission crew and had a full mission crew console as well as the flight instruments for navigation. And then just behind them and to the left, well, to the right, if you're walking backwards, was an airborne intelligence officer. So we did fly our entire time with an intel officer on board that would do real-time interpretation of uh, sensor data to send off to answer commander's critical intelligence requirements. So they had a little bit different function than the battle management team that they sat pretty close to, but there were a few data racks between them. And the battle management team in my day consisted of air weapons officers and a senior director, as well as the mission crew commander. And between that relatively small team, and there's various schemes of organization, depending on the mission you're supporting. But long story short, they would take that sensor data in a quick time, turn it into a target list, issue it out to aircraft under the control, and then track the effects that those aircraft delivered. The mission crew commander would oversee not just the operations of the entire aircraft, but also played a critical role often in uh, determining the order of those targets and reporting it up to the air operations center. Then behind the battle management team, you had the surveillance team that was manned and staffed primarily by enlisted air oper uh, enlisted career enlisted aviators. And so we had a senior data technician or an SD tech or senior director technician, sorry. And they managed a small crew of enlisted folks that basically their job was to look at radar data, look at the geographic features, tag it with symbology that could then be communicated over data links. Um, that allowed the battle management team to sort this data, but they were really at the ground, like right at the origin of seeing and detecting something and determining whether it uh, needed to be prosecuted and how it needed to be communicated. And then in the very far back of the aircraft was a sensor management officer. It's actually a trained air battle manager. And then what their job was to manipulate the sensor, the sensor settings to, to maximize the data returns based on the mission. And so that's really the front to back. Now we also up in the battle management team was an army officer. And in the back was also two other army surveillance technicians. And their job was to take that sensor data and communicate it down to the ground forces uh, which we actually had an army um, component with this and the ground force for the support, the ground commander schema maneuver as well. They played a role in how the sensor would be uh, operated too, but they were really, they were making double use of that data and they worked hand in hand with the air force officers on board to ensure that as targets needed to be prosecuted as it related to the army, that we had truly an integrated and joint operation. So really unique feature of the J stars that uh, the AWACS didn't necessarily have the counterpart to. So that's kind of the, the summary there. Slick, does that cover the basis for you? You know, one thing that you did miss as a Viper guy, I always heard you guys brag about the galley and the number of bathrooms that you had on board. So I just want to throw that out that you missed that in the walkthrough. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we did have the we did have the galley. It was uh, necessary for some of those long sorties, which, by the way, could go upwards of 20 hours. And the two bathrooms were, were definitely requirements, although sometimes we did have to go to Viper style operations when the bathrooms reached capacity on those really long combat support missions. So now, Bobby, can you compare this to the AWACS? Because you served on both, and that's super cool for the audience to learn about. Yeah, so like I mentioned before, I started out on the E3. So the E3, same approach. You, you walk up to it on the ramp, and the first thing that you're going to see is, is the big black and white rotodone that sits on the aft part of the aircraft. But you'd also notice towards the front of the aircraft was a passive detection system, so two little cheeks, it looks like. Uh, just behind the crew entry door on both sides of the aircraft. And on the front nose and on the tail, there was also a pod. And that was our passive sensor suite that we had near and dear to my heart because I was an electronic combat officer on the AWACS as well. 
And so you'd see the same complement of antennas, not exactly the same, but similar looking to the general audience. And then as you get on the aircraft, a big difference in the E3 is that the flight deck actually had the navigator up in the flight deck in the cockpit itself. And then working your way backwards on the E3, you actually have your comm technicians right up front. They basically would set and manage your radios and your links. And then you would have your computer a data technician and then followed by your battle management team. And now they have recently changed the crew construct on the AWACS lately, but it largely remains the same where in the back you have a combination of officers and enlisted that provide a battle management function oriented generally towards the air and the surface. So a weapons team with a senior leader there or an SL as they call it now. And that senior leader basically makes sure that the air weapons officers are executing their functions and their geographic area to support Slick, which you would know uh, in the F-16, which we always provided a lot of control to F-16s, supporting your target timeline, which moves a lot faster than the ground moving targets. And then your senior leader in charge would basically orchestrate that across several flights of F-16s or lanes, depending on your mission or operations areas. Then there's a senior leader in charge. Think of that as the MCC equivalent on the J-STARS. Then they also had a surveillance team. And then a passive sensor operator, the artist formerly known as electronic combat officer that manages the passive suite. What the passive suite allowed you to do is basically create a combat ID that Slick really helped you out. So at range, I'd be able to not only detect it with the radar, but also get a radar signature off of it that would allow me to upgrade its targeting, which really helps you in your weapons employment and the tactics as you might approach it. So that's a really cool function that E3 could do between it. Now, also inside the E3, the combat crew, the senior leader in charge and the SL, along with the surveillance team. They have uh, chat capabilities and they have link capabilities back to the AOC to provide what is known in the business as the common operating picture. So that's kind of the long and the short of the E3. So big differences between the mission is what the sensor data they're using to battle manage, the pace of the conflict, basically, how time plays a role in that, the weapon systems they support. But at the end of the day, it's all battle management and it's basically a, a weapons resource management. Yeah, absolutely. A, a tremendous part of the overall air power team there. And as we've mentioned, anytime we were working with an AWACS, our timeline and targeting and execution was just, uh, you know, 10 X by the SA and capability that you guys brought to the fight. Now, you are battle managers in both uh, the AWACS and the JSTAR. So how does that differ from jobs executed uh, in the Combined Air Operations Center or KAOC and from what Intel does? Wow, Slick, that's a, that's a big question, and it's one we get often. So we'll work big to small here just to break it down. So the AOC, or the Air Operations Center, think brick and mortar in its traditional sense. They're located kind of all over the globe and, and in the U.S. They're traditionally tasked with the management and execution of the operational level of war. So they have a strategic plans division. They're charged with the 72-hour air tasking order development and think major muscle movements, like where the big blocks of things are going to go, when they need to be there and how it's going to integrate in the overall theater campaign plan. The AOC is kind of your one-stop shop for that. And that's where the CFAC lives. So that's the air officer that's in charge of all the air components. And that's their node into all of the air assets. The AWACS, the JSTARS, and what we are discussing in this podcast, but probably will later, the ground theater air control system, what they provide is a much more granular level of battle management and control. So I'd say that's really the link between the AOC and battle management is AOC, think big muscle movements, a little bit longer timeline. That's where the senior leader, big decisions are made. The AWACS, the JSTARS, the ground theater control system, they're working that day-to-day, hour-to-hour execution of the air tasking order on behalf of that combined forces air component commander or the CFAC. Now, getting over to the Intel side of things, I'd say the biggest difference between intelligence and Intel operators and battle management is the time difference and the relationship between data and how you execute against it and the time there. And so I actually wrote my weapon school paper on this concept when I was out at Nellis And really, basically, battle managers aren't charged with answering a commander's critical intelligence requirements the same way that an intel officer is. What we do is I take delegated authorities that are given to us from the combatant commander. I use the data that's coming in from not just our sensor, but others as they're being piped into the battle management floor. And I make judgment calls on what targets should be prosecuted when and and based on uh, what their effect should be or what their effect may be. And then at that time in the pace of war, that doesn't really let me do the detail analysis that our Intel operators do. And so our Intel operators, they develop really refined products. What I do is I take data and I provide a timely service to the pilots and the effects generators like yourself. 
Yeah, again, a great rundown. And I really appreciate that. I want to switch over to Doug quickly because you hit on this earlier, Doug. When did you get the sense that things were going to change for air battle management from a mission standpoint? Yeah, I mean, it came about at the end of the last decade. And if I had to, to pin a leader onto it, it would, I'd really, Chief Staff of the Air Force, General Dave Goldfein, is probably the one that began articulating a very different vision for how we're going to execute warfare, not just in the Air Force, but in a joint fashion. And it was through a very networked set of capabilities. And it was all about how we do the smarter force employment, right asset, right time, right place, stay away from threats that are, that are too dangerous and, and be smarter. And it was all driven by the notion that the Pacific was going to be very dangerous given the Chinese threat, and that it's huge. And so you dilute aircraft numbers very fast because, look, we all know we have the smallest Air Force inventory-wise in, in services history right now. You put that in a theater the size of the Pacific, and all of a sudden, something like 100 F-22s, which are the ones that are combat-coded, it, it, it dilutes that to nothing real fast. 20 B-2s, similarly. So how do you ensure you get those things right time, right place? It all comes down to effective battle management. And we also faced a compounding problem that the J-STARS and the AWACS, they were just getting old and everybody knew that. And Bobby talked about the J-STARS as a, a bridge solution from day one. And they were supposed to have the E-10 in the early 2000s. Well, that was cut. So they extended another decade. It's a classic Air Force story. The AWACS had been around since the mid 70s flown super hard. So everybody kind of knew the time was up on these assets. And so they launched two different programs, one for JSTARS, one for AWACS, and they're really linear replacement efforts in many ways. On the AWACS deal, it was the E7 wedge tail came about. JSTARS, it, it was a business jet size aircraft with a similar sensor like what JSTARS has. They go out and execute their missions, but that whole notion of threat, and plus, let's remember, budget pressures are a big factor. The Air Force snapped a chalk line and said, for the ground uh, target indicator mission, we're going to move that to space-based. We're actually going to skip this interim solution. And by the way, the air solution will go that way as well uh, for the AWAX replacement, but we're going to stick with an interim for some risk management, stick with the E-7. But as far as we're talking about with JSTARS, the sensors go to space. The battle managers obviously remain terrestrial based, but there's a highly networked system. And it's also one that can be fed from other sensors and theater with AESAs and, and things that are on different assets. And so a very disaggregated, very distributed. It's also very ambitious. I mean, the technical challenges here are significant. And I think that's why kind of keeping the E7 as, as a bridge piece to manage some of that risk is probably a smart option, but that's where we're at. But it's all about right time, right place, managing the threat, and it's just vital. And I would say we thought it was important for the last 30 years. It is going to be really important given where we're going. Yeah, Doug, I cannot agree on your last point there. I mean, the importance of this weapon system coming online, it's just, it's such a national security imperative. We, we've got to get this going. And, and Bobby, you're on the cutting edge of this transition. So walk us through the macro challenge you uh, and your leadership are trying to address. Yeah, so Doug hit on the E7, and the E7 is definitely, you know, a program that is being discussed a lot as that bridge solution as, as a sensor, you know, an AMTI sensor is something that, as I mentioned early on, the, the platforms are often associated with the sensor, but also that battle management network or that battle management node. But on the other side of this, what we're working on, and I'm a part of the 461st Air Control Wing right now, is how we're going to get after some of the ground theater air control systems. And so we talked about this new technology that where the sensors are, the communications, the battle managers being terrestrial based. What all this really is, is kind of a whole new concept of operation that we need to think about critically as, as not just a service, but a joint service as well, is how we're going to present our C2 forces, how we're going to organize them. And then really in this interim, how are we going to develop tactics, techniques, and procedures to give those combatant commanders options 
uh, scalable, tailorable options so that they can see and communicate and, th- and the war and the air battle, it can be managed effectively. So right now, down at the 461st, we're building a new facility that is a part of a larger, it's one of the new four elements that are outlined inside of ACC's Battle Management or BMC2 Roadmap. And the organizations that support it, we have a few different courses of action that are going out here. And so really what we're looking at is that the E7 will be one part of several new components of what was traditionally the AWACS and the JSTARS that will uh, be flexible, a little bit more tailorable, or a lot more tailorable, actually, that will fully leverage these new technologies in both communication and sensing. So we're down here wrapping our minds around that problem right now. We've got a couple of different courses of action that we're pursuing. So yeah, I think that covers the base for you there, Slick. Yeah, well, I'm going to ask you to break it down uh, in macro lanes again, because I'm guessing there's technology which involves the sensors, the connectivity, and the processing power. And then, of course, there are the people that involves the traditional battle managers plus new folks. It's something like Guardians operating the sensor constellation. So all of this is going to need an organizational construct. Yeah, so I think a good way to break it down and a good model to think about it in big bins. And this is something I worked on at the Mitchell Institute as well Is you know, you have three big components. It's a trinity really of C2 and battle management. You have sensors, you have decision makers, and then you have actors that go out and prosecute based on the decisions that are made and the data that they could see. And linking these things together are the communication pipelines. And so on an AWACS and a JSTARS, two of those three components were represented right there on the airframe. You had a sensor and you had a, you had decision makers and they could issue things out to the actors. Well, as Doug alluded to, these things aren't as survivable in the Pacific. Our concept and assumptions about how we could go to war have changed based on increased ranges of weapons from our adversaries. And so let's think about it. You know, sensors aren't just strapped to airplanes anymore. So communication technologies allows us to disaggregate sensors, which really gives us a better picture. So space-based sensors, terrestrial-based sensors, airborne sensors that are on the E7 and other platforms. And now they can pipe that data over IP, which lets us get into technology or communication technology now. They can connect over various communication forms to get into uh, battle management nodes and command and control nodes, which now allows them to, one, get a better picture, and two, be more survivable. And so... Now we can start to see both in the sensing and the comm realm where members of the Space Force come into play because a lot of these sensors are going up in orbit. Obviously, space supports a lot of our comm technologies now. And in fact, we've moved some battle managers over to the Space Force to begin looking at some of these problems as well. Not very many, but uh, a contingent to be represented. So I would say between the sensing grid that we've developed over the course of years, the communication, the advent of long haul and IP based comms has allowed operators from a lot of different career fields to be in more survivable locations, to be more effective and to communicate out to the actors that are in the battle space. Now, as Doug alluded to, you know, a lot of this stuff is still in its development stage. Like we are having to wholesale rethink the way we've done command and control for the first time really since World War II. I mean, we had a traditional way of going to battle with set assumptions that have really been changed a lot with the tactical problem and the operational and campaign problem that we have in the Pacific, and C2 is going to have to adapt as well. Yeah, that, that is a great point. This, you know, haven't had to do this since World War II. Doug, what are some of the challenges going from the JSTARS AWACS model of uh, sensors on an airframe with a crew, and how is this going to affect the global enterprise system? It's a really big deal. To go from an encapsulated mission system that Bobby described on a single aircraft to one that's highly disaggregated, it brings about a lot of challenges that need to be managed very deliberately. And I would say it starts with requirements. Think about it. AWACS, JSTARS, you had one plane, integrated set of systems, the sensors, the comm links, the people were on board. That led to a program office managing that thing and coming up with requirements, modernization, funding lines, you name it. It was a tight team. Now you're having numerous programs run by a lot of different people, and we need to keep those all synchronized and aligned. And that's not easy, especially when you're given the classification items that are in play. And you got two services, Air Force and Space Force. And so you got to keep everybody on the same sheet of music. And that is going to be a challenge, I I definitely would predict. Then you extend that to Congress. Before, AWACS and JSTARS, they were owned by single subcommittees, Air Land. Now it splits apart because different components are owned by different subcommittees. And so the space-based piece is owned by strapped forces. The other elements are still going to be with air and land. I mean, so when you're talking about oversight, 
managing programs, budgeting, you have to make sure those subcommittees are talking to each other to keep these elements moving in tight formation. And if one takes a, a financial mark against a program in one lane, but the other side doesn't do it, you can see these things will have challenges and they can get decoupled unintentionally. Then you move it back kind of into, into the operational side of things. You've got a question because space intel assets normally have been what we call national intelligence. And by that, I mean supporting top level decision makers, presidential level, cabinet level. That's different than feeding the combatant commands where you have the actual war fighters under Title 10. And guess what? If you're uh, choosing who gets to control where a uh, sensor is placed, I think the presidential daily briefing book wins out every single time. And you talk to warfighters that have had to plan campaigns and execute in, in recent history. And, and by that, I mean the last 30 years, it's been a continual problem. So you need to make sure this is a battle management set of capabilities. It has got to be very COCOM specific to ensure it responds to those warfighters. Can others in other parts of, of the community pull from it and use it? Great, have at it. But first and foremost, it's got to be warfighter centric. And that's because it's what Bobby said earlier. This is all about supporting decisions that are happening real time in the theater. That is seconds and minutes. That is different than days, hours, weeks, or months. And so cannot foot stomp that enough. And then you look at this whole notion of access within a theater, the AWACS and the J-STARS were kind of beneficial with their construct. It was an airplane that just had sort of a natural mission radius, sensor could see so far, everybody was on board, kind of protected the asset. It allowed them to support use, like in, in your F-16 or, or J-STAR sources on the ground, without a lot of people messing with it. It took off and did their thing. Now, anybody and their cousin could come in and start messing with this. And we saw this in the early days of remotely piloted aircraft with Predator, where you had these tactical ISR systems and yet all of a sudden you had SecDef with a little TV screen on his desk, no kidding, watching this stuff. And it was nuts. So we've got to ensure that there is very defined roles of missions, who's doing what. And we cannot confuse tactical with strategic leadership and who's guiding this thing. And then there are technical things. You have to have assured communication links. You don't want the sensor feeds to be late with latency issues and all that. It's got to be very, very fast. So it's a big list. All of these have to be thought through very deliberately. It's why people like Bobby are crucial to the equation because he's got the battle management experience, but he's looking at how they can do this in the future. And, and we've really got to watch that big time. Uh, Bobby, any thoughts to hop in on? Yeah, Doug, you, you kind of hit on a few different points there that I think are important to manage. The battle management capabilities that existed on the edge of the, of the battle space, you know, when they were originally conceived in the J-STARS and the AWACS, the technology didn't really exist uh, for the SecDef to have the television screen that let him really get down to the tactical level of war and, and to track it like that. And what I saw really between my first and my second deployment on the AWACS in the early 2010s was on the first deployment, I had a lot less oversight, if you will, uh, from the AOC. When I came back for the second time, a lot of the authorities that had previously been delegated out to the battle edge had been pulled up into the AOC and like pulled up to higher echelons of command. And I think that was really kind of a symptom, if you will, of a super permissive air operational environment that was the Middle East. And we were there for a long time. We have a whole generation of officers that are used to employing in a theater where we didn't have a persistent air threat that would pose the same kind of threat that our adversaries in UCOM and the Pacific would pose. And so because of that, we kind of saw a, a degradation, if you will, of not just the appreciation, but also the TTPs for that on the edge battle space decision maker and the reason why they need to be there. And so I'd say that's one point. And that also ties in some of those large national assets that you made and that the time that would be basically allowed and, and, and considered acceptable for the time of intercepting data, interpreting data and making decision off of it we had more time to do that in the Middle East than I think we're going to have in the Pacific. And so access to that data, the latency of that data for some of these sensors is definitely an area that we have to explore on how to give warfighters at the battle's edge access to the best information possible to make in the moment tactical and operational decisions that are going to impact strategic outcomes of the war. 
Another point that I'd like to bring up too, this isn't just between the Air Force and the Space Force. You know, the Army, the Navy, the Marines, they are all looking at how they're going to get after their C2 and battle management problems in the Pacific. And in, in many ways, we're still kind of operating in stovepipes. And Doug, here's a great example. Like the Air Force just retired J-STARS only for the Army to turn around and buy the Sentinel program from the UK, which is in effect a smaller version of a J-STARS. And how that's going to contribute to a C2 network, we haven't really begun to broach in the Air Force yet. And so at least not at the operational and tactical warfighter battle management levels. And so we really need to put some effort into making sure all of our operational theories are aligned between our services so that we don't uh, recognize a whole lot of inefficiencies as we go to acquire programs and comms and sensor systems and then integrate them into battle management nodes. And that's definitely an area down at the 461st we've taken a hard look at is how we're going to align our capabilities uh, to provide an integrated and truly joint command and control and battle management network. And I do think that there's some parsing we have to do between command and control and battle management. Those terms often are kind of seen as synonymous. They're definitely different, probably for a, a scope and scale outside of this podcast. But from uh, that perspective, I think there's a lot of work to be done on integrating our capabilities to make sure we aren't double tapping and triple tapping money and basically shortchanging the taxpayer and the warfighter at the same time. Yeah, Bobby, your, your comment of, you know, the success that you all built uh, with this ecosystem really pulled a lot of the decision-making up the chain of command, and we probably won't enjoy that timeline. So we're really glad that you're focused on that. One question I really have for you is how do we grade your homework five or 10 years from now? And what are the key markers to watch? Yeah, so I think key markers to watch that I think we would all be familiar with are how we acquire new battle management technologies. That is, in our case, the TOC, as we refer to it, or Tactical Operations Center, a family of systems, as well as the E7. And so how we buy and the numbers we buy are definitely going to impact what we can do and, and what kind of force we can, uh, forces we can present. So I would say what success is going to look like is uh, in five and 10 years is that we are presenting, and I say we, the joint forces and the Air Force are presenting a scalable, tailorable, fully integrated battle management system that gives these senior leaders and commanders and the warfighter at the battle's edge what they need from an information and target level, the management they need top to bottom from the tactical all the way to theater, and, and a system that's rapidly deployable. It's mobile, uh, not just physically mobile, as we like to think of it, but digitally mobile as we have to move as forces are uh, attrited, which we have to think about and in war, you know, we're going to lose things. Um, we have to move that service from one place to another. Modern comm technology allows us to be digitally mobile, and that's going to make us more survivable. And then the sensor grid should make us more thorough. And I'd say that scalable, tailorable, fully integrated solution offered up to combatant commanders is, is what success should look like as we move into the future. And along with that, how we organize our C2 forces, train them, you know, organize, train, and equip these forces to do this and offer that up. I think we've seen over the years, it's going to be, it's going to be very difficult for each theater to own their entire, their own entire air force, especially C2 and ISR, which are exquisite systems. So one of the areas we're looking at right now is what does a C2 task force look like? How do mission oriented C2 wings uh, look like in the air force? So maybe instead of having an AWACS wing and a JSTARS wing, Maybe you have a, a mission-oriented C2 wing that is charged with a certain component, whether that be a domain orientation or, or some other type of organizational scheme, but basically allow us to go into a theater, give the commander options, get there quickly, and win the war and get inside our enemy's OODA loop. Well, well, Bobby, what about the people? I know we, we've mentioned that before, but you know, battle managers take years to cultivate, and it's a complex art. So how do we sustain your career field as we work through uh, this transition? Yeah, so like, that's a really great question and a, and a very complicated one, too. Battle management, just like flying an airplane, it requires practice to get good at. You know, how long does it take a 10-year experience battle major to get created? And that's 10 years. With the retirement of half the E3 fleet and the entire JSTARS fleet, our career field effectively lost 32 operations floors to practice this craft. And just to think, put this in scale, one AWAC sortie could provide training for up to 40 people at a time. And so you can imagine like this massive loss of capacity that we just sustained here. And I'm not going to lie, that, that makes me a little bit nervous when I think about being charged with bringing up the next generation of operators. And we didn't necessarily like onboard the E7 as a direct replacement for this. And so I, I think there is a, a high risk of a skill set eroding here and thought processes that have been developed over years not being practiced and having to be relearned at a time where 
it's going to be very costly to do so, which is going to be night one through seven of or first 30 days of a major theater conflict with a near peer adversary. And so we are utilizing new SIM capabilities, but that can really only go so far and we need help. And so from a people perspective, not only do we need to get these operators trained in their battle management craft, but at the same time, this career field is cultivated and developed thinking into battle management and C2 that while it exists in other career fields, like that is our specialty. I've spent my entire career getting familiar with not just one weapon system it's an employment, but a whole myriad and menu of weapon systems across the joint service and how they should integrate and talk to each other. And uh, when that skill is not practiced because we don't have the platforms to get there, the operational centers to get there, then that nucleus of thought is also going to start to erode and it's going to force new lessons to be learned down the road too. We're going to effectively have a degradation of that cadre. So not only is it taking care of people and the skills they provide the warfare, uh, warfighter immediately, but it's also a lot of that academic and historic knowledge of how we should do things better and those lessons learned that get passed down that I think we're at risk of losing here. Yeah, great point on that. And Doug, I want you to hop in uh, as well. I want to foot stomp everything Bobby just said. And, and this is a two-part solution here to, to protecting this career field. It comes down to, to the Air Force and Congress. We've got to work together to protect and sustain the battle management career field. I mean, like Bobby said, it's unbelievably complex, these skills. This is, in many ways, it, it, these are artists and because it's such a dynamic set of, of variables they have to manage. This isn't just, hey, push this button and this happens. I mean, years to grow this talent. And it's going to be very easy for battle managers to get discouraged. They see their airframes disappearing. The replacements are years off. What the heck do I do? Is my career field wrecked? That morale piece is going to be very challenging to make sure people don't run for the door. And so signals need to be sent from the top, backed up by resources and consequential decisions to, to back these people up and show that they have a future and that we want them to stay. And then it comes down to just the natural personnel system. It's going to be really tempting for them to rob billets in the near term to save cash. And it's also going to be really easy for talent to kind of migrate elsewhere. And then it just disappears into the ether. And we're in this bridging period. And so all of that could really deplete the talent pool. And we got to guard against that. I'd like to highlight what happened in the 90s when the Air Force, uh, I would say very imprudently, sunset the vast majority of its electronic warfare capabilities and, and the operators. We've never recovered from that. And yet electronic warfare, spectrum warfare is one of the most consequential, important things right now. And we don't have a bench. I mean, what does it say when one of the senior most representatives of that career field is a colonel right now in the Air Force? Guess what? Colonels get outvoted by generals. It doesn't work. And so we have to be very careful about how we steward this field. Yeah, Doug, I could not agree more. And, and of course, we're getting tight on time here. So any final thoughts? Yeah, yeah, I appreciate everything that we've done here talking about the, what the skills we bring. And we are making some headway. There is a lot of there's a lot of good thinkers that are scattered across the Air Force right now that are looking at this problem. But, you know, as Doug said, the, the resources to back some of this up, the resources to get after really applying the thinking that we need to do to, to posture ourselves to be ready to, to win that near peer and give our senior civilian leaders options at the table as opposed to being hemmed in because we just can't get there to make effective decisions. So I appreciate uh, the time and the venue here to discuss the career field and, and what it brings to the fight. Now I'll jump in. First and foremost, this is all going to move at the speed of money. And that's why the underfunding of the Air Force and the Space Force is so bad for the country. And it's also why these continuing resolutions that we seemingly can't get out of on the Hill are so corrosive because these are very dynamic programs as they move forward. Guess what? We're locked into last year's funding limitations. So we can't modernize the funding profiles and update them for where these programs need to go this coming year and beyond. It's, it's disastrous. And so look, we already pushed JSTARs and AWACS way too far in terms of how long we used them. I mean, the, the airframes are literally failing structurally. And now we pushed the start button on these new solutions too late. So we've got these gaps. And the budget pressures are just going to exacerbate it all. And it all comes down to momentum. And so I think we just got to really keep attention on this. And it's a small career field. People take it for granted. And we've just got to keep bringing attention onto this. 
And from all of us here, I really just want to take a moment to salute everyone tied to the JSTARS mission, from the visionaries that conceived the mission, uh, to industry who innovated and sustained it, especially to Northrop Grumman on that front, to the maintainers who kept the jets going, the air crew who flew it, and of course, the battle managers, the heart of this enterprise. And you guys have done nothing but perform under pressure over the last 30 years, and you've changed what it means to fight in the modern era at core levels. And we just can't thank you enough. So with that, gentlemen, it has been a pleasure. Thanks so much for your time, both Bobby and Doug. Yeah, thanks, Slick, for having me on. And uh, I look forward to having more C2 conversations with the Mitchell Institute in the future. Hey, Slick, always a pleasure. With that, I'd like to extend a big thank you to our guests for joining in today's discussion. I'd also like to extend a big thank you to our listeners for your continued support and for tuning in to today's show. If you like what you've heard today, don't forget to hit that like button and follow or subscribe to the Aerospace Advantage. You can also leave a comment to let us know what you think about our show or areas you think we should explore further. As always, you can join in on the conversation by following the Mitchell Institute on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or LinkedIn, and you can always find us at mitchellaerospacepower.org. Thanks again for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Stay safe and check six.